So this is the very first personal development book that I have read at the start of my career. And it's a fictional story about a local chap called Alex Rogo, who was a manager in a factory underperforming in the delivering of products in terms of being delivered on time. And the company, or that particular factory, I should say, was on the brink of closure. Now, whereas the theories taught in this book are widely used by management consultants and improvement practitioners, today we will extract the key principles in the context of personal productivity. Hello, 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 and welcome to a new episode of the Needle Movers podcast, the podcast that brings you the lessons, books, and concepts we wish we had known earlier on in our lives. As always, here with you, myself, Mark Jasons, and my co-host, Valeria Tomasa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode. So if you're listening today, our episode is from our book club series, where we will be discussing The Goal by Eliyahu Goldratt. I'm noticing every time I do an introduction, Valerio purposely gives me a name he knows I'll struggle to pronounce <laughs> and, uh, and I'm struggling I'm like Whew, it's gonna be a hard one uh if you've heard the start of our episode you'll know that he said it was like one of the uh first personal development books he read at the start of his career um that's also true for me uh I think it's a book we both shared and was like oh this is very interesting <laughs> and at least for myself it um uh kind of sparked my career trajectory from that point onwards because I did end up going into consulting trying to I guess emanate that lifestyle you were like I want to be this guy I didn't want to be that guy but I like the <laughs> challenges he faced and the the way you had to think and have certain concepts and practices to achieve certain goals and I was like I want to be able to implement that I want to have that kind of thought process and it's funny because once you get in the industry everyone's like yeah everyone's read that book (laughs) (laughs) there's so many versions of it too but yeah it's um it's a very from both of us i think it's one of the books that sparked us getting to where we are now in terms of this podcast and in terms of our careers in a sense so before we start talking about the topics today let's provide some context from the book so we mentioned that this book is all about manufacturing. And if you've not been in, about, in a manufacturing or operational environment before, what typically happens is that you have a series of steps or processes within a manufacturing environment. And from our particular book, the steps had machines involved that needed to perform a task to produce an end product. So you can think of this maybe as uh, the production of uh, your iPhone or your watch or uh, the tablet or whatever device you're listening to us. It will go through a typical series of steps, maybe machines, maybe manual assembly, whatever it is. And one of the key problems that the factory faced was that, was that at face value, all the departments, all the processes seem to be fully productive. However, if you walked around the facility, you will notice that there were problems. There were problems because there was a inventory waiting from one process to the next and piling up. There was problems because the customers were not receiving pro- products on time. So I guess the question here is, if all the steps in the process are productive and producing, how come customers were being disappointed? And here is where um, the goal highlights it. Although each step of the process was optimal, always working, they failed to see the bigger picture. They they failed to think big. So some steps took longer than others. And when you fail to see this, it means that you will end up in a position where various steps in the process work at different paces and produce a different number of products. So for example, take step one. That could produce, say, 100 items in one hour, whereas step three may be only able to produce 30 items per hour. And that's that that inconsistency that ends up getting you, regardless of the production. Are you assessing the whole thing holistically? And in addition to that, because we optimize locally, what that means is that step one may be able to produce 100 items of the same of the same product because it's attempting to maximize the productivity. So they are just looking 
to perhaps reduce the setup time or reduce the number of material changes, so on and so forth. If, you, if you're not looking at the customer demand, which is you know much further downstream or the downstream processes, it becomes most efficient at the local level, but very inefficient at a macro level. So from this, there's two key concepts uh, from the short context from the book that are relevant to this episode. And it's really uh, about understanding. So when it comes to understanding, there's two things. One is understanding waste, whereas the second is understanding bottlenecks. Now, if you heard what we were saying above, just by the fact that we started with step one having 100 and step three having 30, you could already tell there's a bottleneck happening, but we'll get into that. So understanding both of these concepts can be the key to unlocking productivity in your day-to-day and in your working life. So topic one, we're going to be looking at defining what waste is. And it's clear that the goal of a manufacturing facility or a business or an operational environment isn't to optimize each of the steps individually. That's the equivalent of working silo as part of a team. As a matter of fact, the goal is to probably make money because otherwise you will close shop the next day. And you can apply this very same principle to your life. Perhaps you can replace money by whatever value is important and significant to you. And understanding the goal helps you understand better the kind of waste that you might have in your life. And that's any action that does not add value to the customer, which in your case is yourself. Mm. So the question that you can ask here is, if you are the customer, what's not adding value to you? And before answering, what we're going to do is just cover the eight different types of waste that you may have in your life. I'll go through them. Um, And yeah, just to get straight. And Mark, if you don't mind, Mm -hmm. I'm going to add in an example for every one of the explanations that you have. And I'm going to make it relevant. I was scared you were going to make me add an example. (laughs) uh, (laughs) And I'm going to make it relevant. That's a, that's a, remember he said this, if at the end of these explanations, you don't feel they're irrelevant, blame Val. But okay. Number one, we'll start with transportation. So this is the unnecessary moving around of material slash work resulting in wasted time. So prime example here, something that I hate to do and I really suck at doing. Time spent backing up your files, cleaning up your folders, um, making the pretty labels. This is non-value added. It's just, in a way, moving material from one side to the other. This is where cloud auto storage came into play, right? (laughs) Precisely. Um, Another form of waste would be inventory. So think of excessive inventory as work that takes up valuable space, requires resources to manage, and it ties up capital dollars slash pounds, depending on your currency. (laughs) So in this case, if you are a designer of some sort, or if you produce uh, work uh, drafts or uh, products, this is where you perhaps keep producing inventory beyond what's required. So if you produce a draft, then you keep producing maybe draft two, draft three, draft four, draft five, although it might not be necessary to the to the customer, which in this case, it might be your boss. Yeah, beyond designers, everyone in work, especially if you feel like you're a perfectionist. And especially, funnily enough, if you take it out to personal life, I think um, when, when someone makes a purchase and then they go back and keep <laughs> adding time, like, oh, but let me just check. Let me just check. You're just losing. Uh, but okay. A third form of waste would be motion. So this is all unnecessary movement. Which sounds like you, Mark. <laughs> so the, the reason why I say that is because Mark uh, travels a lot for his, uh, for his job. And uh, you could argue that that's value added because you go see customers, which is important. But to a large extent, it can be classified as a necessary waste because you still have to travel to get to see your customer. However, if there was a magic way of getting Mark from A to B a lot quicker, that would be more efficient and it would be less of a waste. So that's why we classify this as a, as a waste. So seeing, seeing customers, traveling to see people, uh, maybe if you work in, in, uh, in an office environment, traveling from the, to the printer, back to your desk, back to the printer because whatever you printed didn't print out correctly, then traveling back to your desk, that, that's all the kind of waste that you have. What's funny about that is what comes to mind is it would take us 
way longer than it takes us to record no write record and edit an episode to travel to each other to meet up and then travel back home to do so and that's why we do it remotely <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> um, so a fourth form of waste would be waiting this is the waste of time waiting for people equipment materials and information to arrive so you, that you can actually do your work so this is a classic one for me because uh whenever you are working as part of a team you always end up waiting for information. You wait for either updates or you wait for an action to be performed. And it feels like sometimes you just spend your day asking for updates. But the very action of waiting is considered a waste. A fifth form of waste, overproduction. So that's producing more than the customer or your process needs, which results in excess inventory and all the expenses described above under inventory. So I'm guilty of this one, um, and I'll give you the root cause in a minute. Oh <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, uh, but think of this as uh, producing two reports for uh, for your boss, and uh, instead instead of just doing one. And the reason why you prefer two is because you want to see which one your uh, your boss prefers out of the two. Maybe one of them is a, a three page document, and uh, which is summarized, and the other one is a seven page document. And now this is wasteful because you just spend time writing pretty much a 10, 10 pages altogether. Whereas before that, I could have fully understood the requirement from my from my boss and just wrote what the boss wanted. Um, so this is overproduction in a way, and uh, it's a form of waste. Speaking of overproduction, number six is overprocessing. So this is doing more than the customer wants, needs, or is willing to even pay. Mark, have you met, ever made uh, an Excel spreadsheet very, very pretty? Yeah, you got to make it user friendly. <laughs> that GUI <laughs> needs to be on point for myself. Just a waste of my time. It, I, I don't. Uh, you know what? I was thinking about this because I'll like add like certain color co- coding and all these things. And the more you learn, the more you like. Well, I, I might as well just <laughs> over, well, over simplify or over process it. I guess. So there is an element of user-friendly uh, that comes into place because, of course, if other people are using a spreadsheet, then yes, you will have to make it user-friendly so that it's adaptable. Um, however, when you spend too much time to the point that you're making it pretty for the sake of making it pretty because you want to feel good about what you've done and because you think that it looks better, then I'm afraid that's over-processing. And I know that I am 100% guilty of that uh, probably 80% of the time. <laughs> So before we get to the last two, staying on over processing, one thing I'd like to put, highlight is um, if you feel like you have enough time in it, because some people will be like, that's my therapy. I need it to look this way. But if you have complaints <laughs> where you're like, I don't have time to do X, Y, and Z, then you probably, it's it stopped being, you know what I mean? A user interface thing and it started to be a blocker to yourself. But anyways, number seven, this is the defects. So the production of a defective product or delivery or of service will require either a rework or scraping, scrapping, sorry, of that whole product. And I think at times this is unavoidable. Uh, this is perhaps where we make mistakes and we have to go back and rework on them. So thinking back to the uh, to the example of a report, uh, this is when perhaps we produce a report, then our manager gives it back to us with feedback. Some of this can be avoided if we fully understand what the customer is trying to tell us. So customer, in the case of a report, again, it could be that we need to fully understand what the boss wants so that we don't make mistakes when it comes to the report. But sometimes those mistakes are unavoidable because we are learning in the job and because we are in that growth journey. And finally, number eight. So before I say eight, I'll just say, this is really all about where's the value add and non-value add, right? So eight is skills, the waste of not using people's talent, knowledge, and experiences to improve the organization, or your own skills and and yourself and your own development in a sense. And so, oh, have you been given an example? I don't want to take your shine. Let's hear it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, I, I think sadly, I see this quite a lot. Um, I see this a lot because I see people with uh, fantastic qualifications and uh, fantastic job experiences and uh, true skill. 
uh, stuck in roles and jobs that uh, that don't give them any justice. Uh, so that's when we don't utilize the people's talent, as you've mentioned. Uh, so you might have someone with an MBA, for example, doing a junior project management role. Mm. Or you might have someone that uh, has got experience in management consultancy, perhaps working in a, in a field that doesn't make use of that skill. And perhaps the person doesn't want to use that skill anymore, and that's fine. But when the person perhaps is willing to use that skill and you can put it to use to better the organization, that's when it's really wasted. Mm. So I guess the question that they might be asking is why are we even telling them this? Why, no, why, why is the book the goal telling us this? Well, I think the book isn't telling us this. However, um, our take on this is that we always struggle to find time. And I, I certainly remember, and um, I am certainly guilty of being the kind of person that always says, oh, I haven't got time for this, or I haven't got time for that. I, I know that at work, I was always the last person to complete any mandatory training. And I do them, but they're always last minute mm -hmm. come. And I don't, I don't know if that's the same thing for you, but I, I'm certainly like one of the guilty ones. If there is a chart of like how quickly you complete your training, I'm definitely like on the bottom uh, performing ones. I just want to say that the problem with me is Mark backwards is cram. So I feel like I have to live up to my name and, and cram things in the last minute to make it work. If it wasn't cram, I would never, I'd never, but it's my namesake. I got to live up to it. All right, cram, let me get back to the point. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, there, there was, um, a former manager that w one time they asked me, why do you not have time? And I thought, because, you know, I'm busy, I got things to do. And then they asked me again, but why haven't you got time? And it's a good question. So I went away and I performed a bit of an exercise to figure out where my time was going. So I was going through my day, I was jotting down the hours, I was jotting down what I was doing, and uh, I was pretty much having a script of my entire day, going through hour by hour. And the next day, I went back to that script just to have a little bit of an analysis of uh, where my day had gone. And it turns out that I spent a third of my day on creating an Excel tool. You know, it can happen because, you know, the tool was great. It was doing a lot of good stuff, uh, as as one would say. Or I just want to say, uh, before you continue, <laughs> the reason I laugh is because I know that if it was paint or Excel, who knows what you was making? Because <laughs> could, he could have been making a whole drawing. It wouldn't even be an Excel thing. <laughs> when he says anything to do with Microsoft Project or Microsoft Word, I'm like, who knows? <laughs> this man was drawing a unicorn in Excel. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, it's, it's fair to say that uh, Mark or Cram, as a, I sh we should call him from now, um, has experienced me using Excel and Paint <laughs> quite extensively for uh, multiple reasons. Yeah. But that, that's beyond the point that I'm making here. Um, so so I, I was making this, uh, this Excel tool, and, and I guess the question that came around was like, why had I spent so long? Um, put, putting this Excel together. So I started going through the principle we discussed a little bit earlier. So the eight waste that, uh, that we discussed. And it's surprising what you find out when you are asking yourself the right question. And it's almost as if you're taking a picture, but you're taking a picture by changing the lenses in front of it. Mm -hmm. And each of the lens almost allows you to see a different detail, a different level of color or a, a, a different depth. So back to the instance of my third of a day spent on Excel, that's 2.5 hours of my day gone on a spreadsheet. And when I started scrutinizing those 2.5 hours with different lenses of the, of the waste types that, um, uh, that, that I was uh, taking in, into consideration, I start making some interesting observation and I start raising some really good questions. And when I look at the at the time spent on the spread or the spreadsheet from a, an over processing perspective, I realized that I spent an awful lot of time tweaking details that didn't offer lot a lot of value. So that's uh, maybe changing the colors, making the pastels instead of making the sharp colors, or adding a logo, uh, making sure that all the fonts were Calibri um, 11, uh, lo looking at like the very minor details. And that all amounted to about 30 minutes of, of my day. 
And then you start looking at it from the defect perspective and using the lens. And uh, how many times have I had to go back to the drawing board because I didn't capture the needs correctly from, uh, from a customer? And if I looked at the from the skills perspective, I should have been asking myself, am I the right person to do this job? I could have actually been teaching someone else how to do it so that the firstly, I would have uh, created that redundancies that didn't just depend on me being able to do that uh, particular task. But secondly, I would have been able to teach a skill to someone else and I would have been able to free up my skill to do something which was actually more value added. So suddenly analyzing this, uh, this bit opened up a whole opportunity for me to free up two 0.5 hours in a whole week. I mean, forget about the training for a second, because probably I still wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, 2.5 hours is an awful lot of time. Like put that in personal development, put that into something which is value added, and it can truly make a difference. It is really, so taking those eight forms of waste, what you're describing basically, it really is critical where you check what is actually value added and non-value added. Because my question here is, during the time where you were doing it, I bet it felt value added. During the time where you're exercising the um, Excel, well, you're expanding this Excel sheet and d diving deep into it until you retrospectively look back and say, was that value add time? It feels like as long as you're filling up time, if you, <laughs> unless it genuinely feels like waste and you know you're procrastinating, this isn't even about procrastination as such. It's about noting, knowing and learning what is the value add time and what is the non-value add time that can be either outsourced or eliminated if necessary and that's a perfect segue i think for the next topic so our second and final topic for this podcast is the theory of bottlenecks uh, and this concept is really around trying to get an understanding of what bottlenecks are so just like a real bottleneck you know how oh, I think about Coca-Cola bottles, but forget about the rest of the bottle. <laughs> Just think about that neck of it. The amount of liquid that is able to exit a bottle is limited by the neck of the bottle. Have you seen that trend where people will swirl it around and then try and, because it will, it, it will kind of eliminate the ball neck? Forget that. <laughs> this holds true for manufacturing facilities in a slightly different way. So there are equipment or processes that take longer than others. The slowest ones set the pace for the overall throughput. So if an iPhone, for example, needs to go through the process and the process te one takes 10 minutes to process one phone, but then process two takes 20 minutes to process one phone and process three takes 60 minutes to process one phone. Your production is going to be limited by the third process. That's your slowest process. Regardless of what you're doing, even though you've got two that are somewhat faster, that third process is the bottleneck if it has to reach that point. And that same concept of the bottleneck that you just described for manufacturing, which was explained in the book, is applicable to personal productivity. Now, if you think to your week as the as the neck of the bottle, you can only squeeze out so much from it, right? Yes, you can probably uh, flex your hours and that means like flexing the opening of, uh, of that bottleneck because you may decide to work 80 hours maybe instead of 40 hours or you may decide to work the weekend. That allows you to make that, uh, that neck more, uh, more flexible, wider. But I think of uh, flexing that uh, opening of the bottle as very counterproductive. If your aim is to be, to be able to achieve more, so that could be more money, more work-life balance, more time with your family, um, flexing the opening of the bottle negatively affects all of these objectives. Because you flex the opening of the bottle, you essentially end up with less time at home. You end up with less time with your family and you are effectively getting paid less per hour. So there is nothing good about flexing that, uh, that opening of the bottle. So instead of flexing the opening of the bottle, what we need to look at is how we can reduce or influence the amount of flow that comes to the uh, neck of the bottle. So I can, I can already hear them asking, how do I re reduce the flow if I keep getting more work, right? And here's a starting point. So one thing that comes to mind as an example which I learned and I experience is, and so to take it on an overall scale is queuing up in different areas. But if you take a flight, for instance, 
This one I learned through Mythbusters, if you've ever watched it. You can get up a flight. Love it. <laughs> but you can get up a flight, right? Uh, and you wait so you can get your bags and leave. But then you then start the walk towards the security. Um, and then, and that walk can take a while. And then when you're at security, you might wait to get through security. That's usually where it bunches out. And then you wait for your bags. Now, people contested mostly or well, waiting uh, because it just takes long. But it always will take a, a time frame for them to get those bags and put it on those belts. So what did they do? They made those journeys. Remember that part that's long from the plane to the passport <laughs> security check as long so that people felt they was doing something. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> you're like, why? Give them purpose. Yeah. Give them I, purpose. I go up some stairs, down some stairs, up some stairs, round some stairs, whatever. So that by the time you get there, you like you accept the fact as long as you have an activity that you have to do. And so people were fine with that. So then it reduces. So it can be seamless depending, of course, if they still, you'll know when you've hit a bottleneck. But anyways, if you wanted to do it for yourself, you should map your day. So see how are you spending your day hour by hour? Can you say like Valerio did, go through tasks under the lens of the different waste types to improve your productivity? And it's interesting because the way Valerio did it was whilst he was doing his day, he was t- tracking on it. You can also do the exercise where you can review in your mind and just plot out what your day typically looks like. But if you have the time, keep a journal of what you're doing throughout the day and see really what you did, Val, is um, a dialo on yourself, a day in the life of study <laughs> to see. It's it's uh, <clears throat> it's called time tracking, isn't it? I think there's even apps that you can uh, that you can get nowadays which are free that uh, allow you to track that time. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a g- Yes, and there's ones on um, your computer you can install as well. If it's allowed, I'm pretty mm, sure of it. True. But yeah, um, the second way is, um, what's that eighty twenty 20 relationships? We've already mentioned this, right? So it's, um, what eighty twenty 20 relationships can you find in your day? The Pareto rule, right? Um, so what 20% of your actions help you achieve 80% of your outcome? Can you prioritize those specifically? What's the worst that would happen if you didn't do the rest? And you know this because the way I, when I started getting more productive was when I started differentiating things into the big rocks that need to be done, the big things that needed to be accomplished in my day. Because weirdly, if I did those, I felt achievement, even though my list was a hundred things, I did five and my, my day was good. (laughs) But if I did 90 things and they were all none of these big rocks that I need to do, that stress still stays. So it's identifying that, that 20% that needs to be done. That's not even, my example was, which is factual, weirdly, is like 95%. <laughs> but don't worry about my percentages. Think about that 20% of that action that you can, uh, activities you can close out and achieve that would at least eliminate a number of um, issues in your day and the ones that you can really deprioritize or even not do because they are they have no uh, end result or outcome if you didn't do them. What's the actual worst that could happen? Finally, if you are looking to optimize your work, What will give you the largest returns? So just like for the phone making process or say the airplane process, if you optimize the first process, that only takes 10 minutes. It's not going to provide you with any benefit because it still has to wait 20 minutes and then it still has to wait that 60 minutes. So however, if you optimize the third process, your bottleneck, it allows you to move that needle, which is the whole point of this (laughs) podcast, right? We want to move the needle and that way you can get them through faster. You can churn out and for your your day you can be as productive as you possibly can so it's, the question is what bottlenecks do you think you have in your day your life and can these ways help you eliminate them so that brings us to the end of this episode doesn't it where we've covered the let's call it the two key principles from uh, the goal by Elia Goldratt Uh, The first topic being understanding the different types of waste that we have available. So just namely, those are transportation, inventory, motion, waiting, overproduction, overprocessing, defects, and skill. And there is a fun acronym for that, which is called Team Food. (laughs) And uh, how you can try to use those uh, defects or those types of waste to look at your day in a different way. And also we discussed the second topic, which was the theory of bottlenecks, which truly allows you to question how can we 
affect the amount of flow, so the amount of work, so that we can be more productive during the day and really focus on the stuff that is truly important for us. Mm. But we hope that you've enjoyed this episode today. And if you have any suggestions for mm -hmm. any other books that you think we should cover or anything else that we should read, please do reach out. We always love to hear your uh, uh, comments and suggestions, and uh, we always try to get back to uh, to everyone. You can get in touch with us on uh, our website. So that's dneedlemovers.xyz or through our social media accounts by following us on at d.needle.movers. And if you like this episode, as always, as Mark says, please subscribe and give us a 4.999999 star review. <laughs> or whatever's the higher number to it, whatever's closest. Just whatever you want to round that to, 4.99999. I don't know what that rounds to. I'm just saying it sounds like you should give that. And then and then give your feedback. We will hunt every time read that feedback the moment after the, re the review is dropped. But uh, on a serious note, it just ensures that uh, we keep writing stuff that is relevant to you and uh, useful to you. So it, any feedback is, uh, is much appreciated. Mm -hmm. As always, I have been your host, Valerio Tommaso, and my co-host... Mark Jasons, of course. <laughs> and as always, till next time... Adios. Do you know what I realized? Uh, <laughs> what? Your... Uh example of the airport was a terrible, terrible example i knew it i was thinking that too as soon as i got to it, i was like they never fix that do they it has all the bottlenecks and none of the resolution <laughs> you were like oh i'm gonna give you a great example of a bottleneck. it is a great and example of a, i'd say it's a great example of a bottleneck but a terrible example of one that ever gets resolved because i've yet to not have a queue i, I was like unless there's no other flights that's the only time but my experiences at airports has not been great so yeah it's nah. not yeah. So what what's a good example oh, wow. is um the motorway. Uh so you know the motorway, the smart motorway, the M1, they will apply speed limits. Uh, 60 miles an hour, limits. 50 miles yeah, variable speed limits. So that's uh to try and manage the bottleneck to create gaps of space so that yeah, you can, so you can uh, relax the traffic. Speed. Which is funny because the whole reason that that is required can be just rubbernecking. Someone looks back, the next person looks back, everyone looks back and then suddenly you need to now various speed limits so that it can actually flow and it oh god i have another example but you're going to say it's terrible again <laughs> go on try it so you know escalators where at tube stations or whatever you go up them and the fastest way is if everyone just stayed in their spot like everyone gets on it and just stays but some people walk on it go left right or whatever and it slows everyone down that's the bottleneck there so if everyone just stayed got on it and just stayed put it would go seamless but no one does that it's weird when you know what can solve a bottleneck, for instance, even with planes, but you know in reality it doesn't get solved. Well, it's better than your airport example, but the bar was quite low. <laughs> Are you so happy with your motorway example? I'm sorry. Do we not still hit motorway bottlenecks too? Like, none of these have been solved. I get that that does that to regulate it, but really and truly... Every journey, there's that red-amber uh, levels in your... Um, in your mark, 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 mm -hmm. mark. I'm gonna stick this on the video. Bye. I'm gonna delete it from the audio. <laughs>